Pope Francis yesterday reflecting on the third beatitude from the Sermon on the Mount, saying, The meek person is not accommodating, but is a disciple of Christ who has learned to defend another land well. He defends his peace, defends his relationship with God, and defends his gifts, preserving mercy, fraternity, trust, and hope. The Diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, seeking bankruptcy protection six months after disclosing it had paid millions of dollars to sexual abuse victims. 106 people were paid a total of around 12 million to compensate for claims of sexual abuse they suffered as children. Great Britain's National Health Service clarifying a new policy that will allow patients found to be homophobic, racist, and sexist to be denied non-emergency treatment. Under those new rules, medical professionals can refuse non-emergency care to patients who harass, bully, or discriminate against them. That policy will go into effect in April. And after visiting with Pope Francis during the region's ad limina visit, Bishop James Wall of Gallup, New Mexico, said that he was encouraged by the Pope's passion for the pro-life movement, his love for the vulnerable in society, and appreciated his openness to discuss anything. For more news with the Catholic Perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tomio, and Morning Glory starts now. On the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Vincent DeRosa. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who teach us that you abide in hearts that are just and true, grant that we may be so fashioned by your grace as to become a dwelling pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns, with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Then they cried to the Lord in their need, and he rescued them from their distress. He sent forth his word to heal them and save their life from destruction. To heal them and save their life from destruction. Tell us more about that psalm. Yeah, that's Psalm uh, 107. And it's one of the psalms that uh, recounts the... Uh, the history of salvation from Israel. And I chose that because, uh, especially the uh, verse 20, he sent forth his word to heal them. Mm. So they're talking about how uh, God sent forth, um, you know, the, the, the power of his healing when they were, um, you know, in the desert. And so how, but that word became flesh mm. and became, you know, became Jesus Christ for us. So um, he brings it to heal them and to save them. And the fullness of that salvation is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, today, you know, it is February. It is Thursday. Uh, and we have been going over Black History Facts um, every day of the month since we celebrate Black History Month in the United States. And today we're going to talk about, maybe you've heard the name Percy Julian from Julian Labs. He was born April 4th, I mean April 4th, April 11th, 1899. He was the grandson of slaves. He was born in Mobile, Alabama. And um, I'm sorry, Montgomery, Alabama. And at that time in 1899, the state didn't educate African, African Americans beyond the eighth grade. So when he got admitted to DePaul University as a, as a sub freshman, he went there and not only uh, excelled, but like became the top of his class. And by the way, it's in a poignant story. His grandfather took him to the train station to see him off from Alabama to Indiana. And his grandfather was a former slave. And when he waved farewell to Julian, his grandfather only had three fingers on one hand because the other two had been cut off because he had been caught learning to read and write. Julian not only finished at the top of his class, he then went to Harvard University for his master's. But then he had to go overseas to the University of uh, Vienna to receive his doctorate in 1931. He was one of the first African-Americans to get his PhD. PhD in chemistry. He became a professor and chemistry department chair at Howard University before resigning to return to DePaul. Now, the interesting thing is he had come up with a way to, uh, I guess, synthesize this type of drug from the African calabar bean. And the drug that he synthesized, they used to treat glaucoma. And it was a scientific milestone when he discovered that. At that same year, he was invited to DuPont to interview for a job. And he went into the, for the job interview and they were like, oh, we didn't know you were a Negro. We're not hiring you. And so he was turned away. I mean, it's just uh, amazing things that this man, uh, kind of prejudice that he went through. But he had a lot of um, 
uh, what do you call it? Um, it, it developments. Uh, I can't remember how to say it because my mind is gone. But anyway, he um, used his work with alkaloids and steroids would transform medical care. He used natural substances such as soybean and the calabar bean for treatments, like I said, the glaucoma and rheumatoid arthritis. So if you've had to treat yourself with glaucoma and rheumatoid arthritis, you can uh, thank Percy Julian. He started his own company, Julian Laboratories, and became a self-made millionaire. He had moved to Chicago and was threatened uh, with violence for moving into a particular neighborhood, but he was such an outstanding person. He went from being hated and enduring arson threats. He then became the Chicagoan of the year in 1951. Um, he died in. Star. I know, and yeah. he died in 1975. He had more than a dozen honorary degrees and more than 100 patents. He became the first African American chemist inducted into the National Academy of Sciences, and he had a Google Doodle. So, we we salute today, Percy Julian. What an awesome story! I thought. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's I great. thought so too. And we are going to have a great show today. What are we talking about? Well, we're going to ask: Does it matter if Jesus is male or female? Uh, evidently, they're confused about that in Germany. Uh, so, so we'll talk about that today. And, you know, I'm sure people have probably heard of Bernie Madoff. If you didn't, he was a gentleman that basically scammed so many people. He scammed $13 billion out of people that believed he was a legitimate investment company. Um, so Bernie Madoff got a long sentence in jail. And now he is, he says he has stage four kidney disease and he wants mercy and to be let out of prison. So we'll talk about should Bernie Madoff convicted of defrauding scores of families be let out of prison early because he's dying. And what is the relationship between the virtue of faith and our Lenten practices? We're going to look at that with some inspiration from St. John Henry Newman later on. Mm -hmm. And we'd love for you to join the conversation. You can find us on Instagram. Just do a search for EWTN. You can also join us by sending us an email, morningglory at EWTN.com. You know, today we also celebrate the, uh, Francisco and Jacinta Marta, the little kids at Fatima. And you know what I remember? I, was, I read a book about Fatima. I remember, I remember, and I just thought, wow, these kids are hardcore. The kinds of severe penances they were doing. And um, that the Blessed Mother had to tell uh, 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 the little girl, don't sleep with the rope on. That's a bit much. Take it off. But they were doing these penances because they saw hell. And they were trying to save souls from, they were trying to do penance to, for these soul, people that were going to hell. And just the, the, the love these children had, the severity of the kind of things that they did. I was like, hell is scary. And, and I also thought about how their lives weren't easy. Like the little girl, Francisca, was told she was going to die by herself. And she was afraid of it. And they were like, that's just what your life is going to be. And she did. She was sick and she died alone. And then her brother, they were said, well, he's going to spend a lot of time in purgatory. I mean, there were just certain things about the saints that I was reading. And I said, Ooh, we, what kind of chance do we have here? But then I realized we all have a chance if we're willing to do his will. And these children are good examples of willing to uh, being uh, wanting and it being able to and willing to do God's will. So I find them to be remarkable, um, remarkable saints. And, and I talk to Lord as my child about them all the time because she's always asked about child saints. So we talk about them. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on Fatima or the, these child saints. Yeah, I was there <laughs> earlier uh, this year, or mm -hmm. last year, last year in the fall and the God chance to see the, the, the church and the graves uh, where they're buried. And we, we even did a rosary walk um, that, that that walks along the kind of the route that mm -hmm. they um, that they were walking when they saw the Blessed Mother. It's just, it's just beautiful um, mm -hmm. witness and how Jesus, you know, how the Lord appears to children, you know, mm -hmm. um, over time. I mean, even in the Old Testament, you know, you have Samuel when the Lord came to him in the temple with with Eli. He was a he was like a, a teenager. Solomon, Mary, Blessed mm -hmm. Virgin Mary. You know, like God really can do amazing things through through kids. Amen. What was that famous quote? Um, I always forget if it's Newman or Merton who said, uh, I believe that the desire to please you does please you. The mm. desire was, to, what is Lord, it? I believe that the desire to please you does please, please you. you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and with, with, which, you know, from the child's point of view and stuff, absolutely uh, fits. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's so a, I've got to remember that the desire to please you pleases you. Yeah. That growth of love in the heart of wanting to, to love the Lord probably is the first step of conversion, going to the path of righteousness. 
But um, we have some uh, some hard stories to talk about. One is about the famed director Steven Spielberg and his wife Kate Capshaw and their adopted daughter. What's going on there? Yeah, so I guess his daughter's following uh, father's footsteps into the movie industry, but I don't think any way that a, a father would expect. Uh, Michaela Spielberg, who's the 23-year-old daughter of Steven Spielberg and his wife, Cape Capshaw, uh, she just announced that she's getting into the f- adult film industry. Um, and, you know, and it's sad because if you look at the quotes that she says, it really sounds – I'm not saying that she was abused at all. I'm not saying that. But when, you know, in my, in my former employee, when you talk to women who were trafficked, some of them – will say some of these same things that they were told uh, by the people who trafficked them and forced them into uh, sexual exploitation. That, you know, some of these women were abused, and that's why they ran away from home. And so they were told, well, now you, 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 can, have your, you can use your body, you know, you can use to control the situation that you're in, and, you know, it's, it's your body. Now you get to be in charge, and you get to decide what happens to your body. But it's just, it was manipulation. But when she says things like, I'm a sexual creature and I got tired of not being able to capitalize on my body I, and I was being tired of being told to hate my body. Uh, who sa- who told her that, that you should hate your body? I, I don't know if she's thinking, just trying to get that from society or what, but working, you know, day to day in a way that wasn't satisfying to my soul. And so porn's going to satisfy your soul now? I mean, I just... <sighs> Ugh, it's just really it just shows me that there's, something, a father. there's something really rotten in Hollywood because uh, uh, what's his name? Lawrence, um, the guy from the Matrix, his uh, daughter got into that foolishness. Fishburne. Too. Lawrence Fishburne's daughter got into that oh, foolishness. Really? There's something, yes, there's something really rotten in Hollywood and among, I don't know, with these families. I also think about the craziness from, um, oh gosh, the guy that was in the movie Shampoo and his sister Shirley MacLaine. Warren Beatty, Warren Beatty and Annette mm-hmm. Benning has a daughter that now says she's a boy and they did all this stuff to help, you know, because they have money. So they did all this stuff to help this child transition. And I thought, where are people common sense? And then you got Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union, Dwayne Wade talking about his 12 year old son is a girl and going on Ellen. And, you know, I was like, where what what is going on in Hollywood? Like their children almost seem like they're on the altar being sacrificed to the culture. And it's just well, and a as, terribly sad situation. As Deacon was saying, it's like, we're, you know, how can there be any claim that uh, um, from, from people in, in the film industry that mm-hmm. there has been sort of this repressive culture, right? Like, we're, where do you see that in Hollywood? Like, what, what mm-hmm. repression are you talking about? Who, who ever told you that the human body was ugly? Or, I mean, like, you know, it, it, so it, 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 re- it really does reveal the the irrationality mm. of um of sin you know i see i think mm. it's, it's just i think it's it really nuts and i, I feel sad. sorry for all these families whose children are caught up uh in that so um, yeah. i understand some things going on with the uh knights of columbus yeah they're publishing a, a new book uh the knights of columbus an illustrated history and uh, it's on my mind because uh, we're actually trying to start the Knights of Columbus Council here at our parish. Ah. Um, and, and the Knights are just such a wonderful organization of Catholic men who do uh, great works of charity around the entire world. It's, it's no longer just an American thing. Many people don't realize the Knights of Columbus are international and uh, have been responsible for tremendous good uh, wherever they've gone. So uh, do consider checking it out because their history is full of just... Just wonderful exemplars for faith, I think. Well, that's a, that'll be interesting when it comes out then. And let's see, what do we have coming up next on Morning Glory? Good luck getting a council started, Father. What do we have coming up next? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to ask, does it matter if Jesus is male or female? And we want to hear from you, our Morning Glory listeners. Email us, morningglory.ew10.com. Tell us your first name and how you're listening. Catch us any time of day with the EWTN app. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. 
Mother Angelica. We have to get back into our hearts and minds the value of life. If you don't care about the unborn, I don't think you're going to care about the elderly. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. And I'm Doug Keck. This is EWTN Bookmark Brief. Just had the pleasure of speaking with Vinnie Flynn and his lovely daughter Erin about their latest book, Mass and Adoration Companion, published by Tan Books, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. Vinnie and Erin, could you give us an overview of what this book's about and why people would be interested in it? Well, I'm hoping people will be interested in it as a companion, That's as the title suggests. So we've tried to select prayers and quotes from saints and popes and, and the catechism and scripture that will help people to enter more completely and more fully into the Mass. There are two sections. There's a spiritual communion section. In the back, there's a section with litanies and novenas and other prayers that they can use whenever. Thank you so much, Vinnie and Aaron Flynn, for this work, Mass and Adoration Companion. Again, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. You get it today. This has been a bookmark brief. We appreciate you stopping by. Missing Catholic Radio in your area? Heed God's call to get involved and start a Catholic radio station. Contact Jack Williams, 205-795-5756, or email jwilliams at ewtn.com. Text us. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Then text your first name, how you're listening, and your comment. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. Hey, besides texting us, could you also do us another favor? Could you help let us know what you think? Help us make the show more interesting for you. You can visit EWTNMorningGlory.com. Look for this black mug on the screen. Then when you see that mug, do something that might seem odd. You're going to click on it, and then something magical is going to happen. It'll take you to another page where you can do a survey. And we need you to take that survey. It's only about 60 seconds, but we want to hear from you, know who you are, and you'll just get some ideas from you. I think that's awesome. We want you to talk to us. So please go and take that Morning Glory survey for us. Right now, you know, I think you're going to have an interesting discussion because, you know, maybe some people legitimately don't know Deacon. And and this is a, a good thing to discuss. Does it matter if Jesus is male or female? I can't remember coming into the church and really ever discussing that point, to tell you the truth. I mean, granted, I was 12 years old, but I don't think <laughs> I ever remember hearing that point discussed. I never thought about it. But somebody had a question, maybe or is challenging that. And I, and I think it's a good idea to, to talk about it. We, you know, these pe- there might be more people that are like, oh, yeah, does it really matter? Yeah, and we want to hear from you, our Morning Glory listeners. Join us on Facebook. Search for EWTN Radio. So most people probably know that there's this um, synod going on in Germany with the German bishops. And one of the German bishops, Bishop Franz Joseph Bode of um, I can't even say the name of this diocese is <laughs> in German, but it says for, but he said for us, Christ became a human being, not a man. And, uh, I was like, wait, what? Scratching my head. And so this professor who was a collaborator of this Bishop also said, God could have also come, uh, become a human being as a woman. Theologically, this would have been possible, but 2000 years ago, it was wise from God in light of the cultural conditions uh, then to become a human being as a man. And uh, she further ex- said that um, in theology, it was always about God's incarnation, not about becoming a man. And the question of gender has no relevance with regard to the theology of redemption. Don't you love how the, this God is so powerful that he can come into human history and do all this stuff, but he's not powerful enough to overcome societal norms, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and, but, and the thing is, when Christ was there, he did uh, devise societal norms. He talked to the woman at the well, and he did certain things like that that people would say, uh, but it's strange, right, that they're saying that, yeah, these cultural conditions, I don't, you know, but let's see what's going on. What, what, what's, but Jesus what hung out with women, though. He had women around him ministering to him. You know, and to his needs, the, the, the Gospels are clear about that. We see women all around. His best friends were, were, were women, right? Martha, Mary, and, 
and their brother but Lazarus. It, and is I'm not, it, I'm is, Isn't this kind of like that heresy that denies or downplays Christ's humanity? I mean, like it's a soft peddling of Christ's maleness to try to say, oh, that doesn't really matter. You know, he just needs to be human, you know. You know what I mean? Well, it, 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 well, it does matter. I mean, you, you look, it's not, and it's not just, you know, imagery. We talk about the idea of Christ is the bridegroom who, as we were reading Revelation 19, verse 9, blessed are those who are called to the wedding feast of the Lamb, you know, where, where Christ the bridegroom is giving life to his bride, the church forever in heaven. But we, we see, when we're confused about marriage, when we're confused about what male and female are, uh, then, then these people here through the synod and, and are getting confused about, well, well, it doesn't matter if Jesus is male and female. Of course it matters. It mattered to God enough for him to, to send his son, you know, um, to, to, to die for us. And, and again, it, it speaks to the role of, of what it means to be a man. And then uh, that, that plan for, for man in salvation history, uh, going all the way back to the garden, Adam, Eve, the fall, all of that. You know, they're just trying to, to, to rewrite history. And I've said this like a billion times. So instead of being made in the image and likeness of God, they're trying to make God into our own image and likeness. They're trying to impose societal norms today on God. <laughs> well, I was That's reading that um, St. Thomas Aquinas said, Christ came to restore human nature by his very assumption. And for this reason, it was necessary that he assume everything following upon human nature, namely all the properties and parts of human nature among which is sex, and therefore it was proper for him to assume a particular sex. This is from his commentary on the sentences. So St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, that's one of the things that he was saying about Christ taking on being male. Well, we definitely, um, you know, John Paul II used to talk about this. Our bodies communicate definite realities, right? Uh, and that communication is enshrined, it is etched, in our physical form, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in the case of the male, the male, it cannot be denied, this communicates to humanity an active principle, mm -hmm. meaning the, the, the male gives and, and the female receives. And we know that because that's how we end up being born, born right? Yeah. That, that's mm -hmm. how children are conceived. Um, and Christ came to be the active principle of salvation. And his bride, the church, receives him right uh mm -hmm. so the church has a feminine identity in how she is identified right uh and but precisely because christ is as deacon was saying he's the bridegroom um and that's beautiful because otherwise we put ourselves in the driver's seat we put ourselves as the active principle and that's where we start getting messed up right so yeah. uh you know this is valid and it it communicates to the very visceral nature of how human beings live and transmit life and that you know that's why it's so important to get this right because nothing communicates to us that deeply i, I keep thinking about christ being a new adam and the virgin the blessed mother being a new eve right and so there's something going on in terms of the redemption of humanity there now we know because neither male or female exist in christ i think that had more to do with the christ redeems both male and female he redeems the the mm -hmm. human species but i do think it's a problem that we are if we deny that his sex matters to me we're denying his full humanity because he was he's a human male and um i i would i would have a problem with people trying to say his sex didn't matter because it does um and but it doesn't mean that women are excluded from salvation and i'm wondering what the impetus for this thought that you know, it doesn't matter that he's male. Did they did they talk about? The well, they're trying they're of... trying to push women's ordination is what they're doing, and, and they're what? and they're trying to yes, they're trying to establish a a a, a, a revisionist theology that's going to uh, fit into this mindset that will in, in their mind eventually lead to the ordination of women as priests. So yeah, of course, I, well, they're, oh. so they're trying to re, redefine marriage, redefine the reality to redefining Jesus. But we love to hear what our Morning mm. Glory listeners think. Does it matter if Jesus is male or female? Email us, morningglorywtn.com. Tell us your first name, how you're listening, and your comment. We'd love to hear from you. You know, I, th I guess I'm, to me it's just it's the facts of the incarnation. And for a reason, he became man, he became male, and he came to earth. I think too little is done 
meditating on the mystery and the gift of femaleness, of womanhood. And so far, unfortunately, we look at everything male and think, well, that has to be the pattern for pe female perfection. And it's unfortunate that they're using uh, or trying to dismiss the fact that Christ was born male in a ploy to get to women's ordination. I mean, y'all, we can't, that, that's the problem. There's something special, unique, and beautiful about being a female, and we need to spend more time meditating on that. And we need to think about why we call it Mother Church. There are good <laughs> things about being a woman, okay? And in the, in the, in the order of creation, we were created after man, right? That's after right. After male, right? So That's there's right. something to be said for being female. And I really think it's the mark of the enemy that tries to avert our eyes away from the beauty and the wonder, wondrousness of being female to make it seem like, well, if you're not a man, you know, forget about it. Well, there's there's a um, another reality here, which is that, um, you know, the just like we were talking about in Hollywood, it's like, well, where are people getting this? Whoever told you that your body was, you know, ugly or that you uh. didn't have meat, right? It's so easy to, to to get into abstractions and draw all sorts of weird conclusions from abstractions. But in reality, right, when you go to your parish, how many people actually feel like women are mistreated in their parish? I mean, think in your actual physical reality experience, right? In an abstraction, people can spin up all sorts of things like, oh, well, in the church, women aren't treated this way and women need more dignity. It's like, how many people in their actual experience of a parish find that women don't have dignity? You know, I, I think yeah, that number would yeah. be a very small number because the reality is just like you can, you know, it's easy to hate people as an, and as an abstraction. But when you meet them as individuals, you realize that they're actually pretty great. You know, same kind of thing here. It's easy to spin up these ideas that, that oh, the church hates women. Is Well, where? You know, where? <laughs> that, that's yeah, that's right. Well, but exactly. again, it's a, it's a misunderstanding of what serving is, misunderstanding of the priesthood. And looking at the world um, as a pattern for how the it, church is supposed to run, they do not even understand the church. Yeah. And so they claim that women have to be mistreated because they're not priests, not understanding, again, to me, properly what the priesthood is, what women, who women are. And frankly, it diminishes the role of women as sisters, mothers, daughters. You know, God made us who we are for a reason. Let's spend more time meditating on that and be thankful for that gift. And yes, it does matter that Christ was born male. we got to respect the facts of the incarnation. Let's see, what else is coming up? We'll be talking about Bernie Madoff. Oh, gosh, the thief, the ripoff guy. Should he be let out of jail early? And uh, stay with us. You can email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. A hot coffee, a warm fire. And Morning Glory, it's Catholic from coast to coast. Dr. Scott Hahn. Jesus gave us the most perfect of prayers. It's always prayed by the Catholic Church after the consecration and right before communion, but always there at the climax of the Mass. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. Now, not only can you watch EWTN anywhere, but anytime with EWTN On Demand. Get on-demand access to more than 12,000 EWTN programs, including live shows and specials, all in one place, all free. Just go to EWTN.com forward slash on-demand. There's nothing to fill out, no memberships required, and no fees to pay. All you need is an internet connection, and you're good to go. EWTN On Demand. Fast, easy, and free. Don't miss a moment of 2020. Try six issues of EWTN's National Catholic Register today for free. Stay connected and follow the latest from Washington, D.C., the 2020 elections, along with events from the Vatican and the world. Only the National Catholic Register brings you in-depth news and analysis from a Catholic perspective. Award-winning journalism that goes beyond what you'll find from any secular news service. Try the register for free today and get it delivered to your home office or parish. To get six free issues, order online at ncregister.com forward slash radio or call 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. That's ncregister.com forward slash radio or call 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. Don't miss a minute of 2020. Call or click today. The National Catholic Register. Read faithfully.
EWTN Radio brings you the Holy Rosary twice each day for over 25 years. Tune in every morning for Mother Angelica and every evening for Father Benedict Groeschel, only on EWTN Radio. Good morning. This is an EWTN Newslink. I'm Teresa Tamio. It's Thursday of the sixth week in Ordinary Time in the Feast of Saints Jacinta Marto and Francesco Marto. Pope Francis yesterday reflecting on the third beatitude from the Sermon on the Mount, saying, The meek person is not accommodating, but is a disciple of Christ who has learned to defend another land well. He defends his peace, defends his relationship with God, and defends his gifts, preserving mercy, fraternity, trust, and hope. The Diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, seeking bankruptcy protection six months after disclosing it had paid millions of dollars to sexual abuse victims. 106 people were paid a total of around 12 million to compensate for claims of sexual abuse they suffered as children. Great Britain's National Health Service clarifying a new policy that will allow patients found to be homophobic, racist, and sexist to be denied non-emergency treatment. Under those new rules, medical professionals can refuse non-emergency care to patients who harass, bully, or discriminate against them. That policy will go into effect in April. As he falls behind in the polls, former Vice President Joe Biden highlighting his Catholic faith. In a new campaign ad, he says his faith got him through the deaths of his first wife and two of his children, adding, I go to Mass and say the rosary. I find it to be incredibly comforting. Biden supports abortion through nine months of pregnancy and has promised, if elected, will work to codify the Roe v. Wade decision as well as support Medicaid funding for abortion. For more news with a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tamio, and now, back to Morning Glory. On the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network, live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Vincent DeRosa. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O God, you who see that we put no trust in anything we do, mercifully grant that by the protection of the saints we may be defended against all adversity this day. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, on God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together extol his name. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard. From all his distress, he saved him. Yeah, that's a great psalm. Mm -hmm. Uh, That psalm is by David, uh, who actually, he wrote the psalm after he faked uh, madness, being insane, uh, in front of Abimelech. So that Abimelech said, this guy's crazy. So he drove him out, and David David was able to get away. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, and, it also reminds me of that song. What's the song you sing when I was a kid? Um, listen, the Lord hears the cry, the cry of, of the, the poor. poor. Yeah, yeah, Blessed yeah. Blessed be the Lord. And, and these are the, uh-huh. the lyrics of the song of, from this psalm. So it also brings you back to a wonderful childhood memory of praising the Lord uh, mm. to, to this psalm. Mm, that's beautiful. I, I thank you for that. And you know what? You'll hear if you go to Mass today, that's the psalm that is read at Mass. Um, just thought you all should know that. So we have been talking about... Uh, you know, people for Black History Month, since February is Black History Month in the United States. And one person we discussed is Percy Julian. He was born April 11th, 1899 in Montgomery, um, Alabama. He died April 19th, 1975. He's the grandson of former slaves. He studied at DePaul University, then went on to get his uh, master's degree and uh, at Harvard University, and then went to the University of Virginia to get his Ph.D., because Harvard would not allow him to pursue his Ph.D. in chemistry at the university. So he left the country to get his doctorate. Um, he became really famous for synthesizing, I don't, can't say the name of the drug, I don't want to mispronounce it, synthesizing a drug from the Calabar bean, which created a drug treatment for glaucoma. And I thought that was pretty awesome. And the sad thing is he was at DePaul University at the time, but the university refused to make him a full professor because of his race, even though he had this big, 
you know, development. He'd gone on to do some marvelous things uh, in terms of uh, chemistry, developing treatment for glaucoma for um, rheumatoid arthritis. He made steroids from soybeans because he realized uh, was when they knew at the time that progesterone was helping women not suffer miscarriages. So he figured out a way to make progesterone from soybeans. I mean, this guy was incredible. He um, also did work with cortisone and hydrocortisone. Uh, just an amazing person. He moved to Chicago uh, where he was threatened with arson and violence for moving to the Oak Park neighborhood. And then over time in 1951, he was named Chicagoan of the Year. What a remarkable person, mm. uh, Percy LaVon Julian. I thought it was a, uh, very poignant that his grandfather, who was a former slave, took him to the train station when he left Alabama to go to school at DePauw in Indiana. And his grandfather waved at him. And on his one hand, the grandfather only had three fingers because the other two were chopped off when he was a slave and was learning how to read and write. And so how poignant that he was sending his grandson off to university for higher education. I mean, just only in America, you guys, only in America just, can you, you know, tell this curious, kind of story. Why would Harvard admit him and get his master's but not his doctorate? That's a, you know, maybe, I don't know, but they would not let him get his doctorate. And probably could be the people in the chemistry department. Just did not oh, want to study man. with um, an African-American. And he faced those challenges throughout his life. He went, he had won some awards and DuPont invited him and some other people to come in and interview. And when he showed up, they were like, we didn't know you were a Negro and oh. we're not hiring you. Oh, and so those kind of very blatant things happened in the United yeah. States. <laughs> and so, yeah, you would think y'all let him in for a master's degree. Why not a PhD? You know, it's just one of those things. And I know PhDs, you know, to be called a doctor of a particular field of study, it's quite prestigious now and then. But That's maybe that deal, they yeah. just yeah, they just, I thought it was too much. No, we can't allow him in this field. So, and he was one of the first African-American chemists to get an award from the National Academy of Sciences. So anyway, we celebrate uh, this wonderful pioneer in chemistry, Percy Julian. Yep. So what do we have coming up on the show after this next segment? Well, a little later, we'll be talking about the relationship between the virtue of faith and the practices that we're about to begin next Wednesday uh, at the start of Lent. And we're going to get some advice on that from Cardinal Newman. All right. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm not sure if people are aware who Bernie Madoff is. Do y'all remember him? He mm -hmm. was arrested December 11th, 2008, for bilking thousands of investors out of billions of dollars. I mean, billions. When he pleaded guilty three months later after being arrested in 2008, he pleaded guilty to charges of fraud and was sentenced to 150 years in federal prison. He's serving his term at a medium security Butner Federal Correction Complex in North Carolina. He's slated for release November 14th, 2139. He'll be dead well before then. Um, you know, Apparently, only a fraction of his victims have gotten all their money back. Um, they said it's about $20 billion in stolen assets. Um, they said even now, nobody really knows exactly when he started stealing from in investors because he made contradictory claims about when the crime began. Um, sometimes he'd say, oh, it started in 1987. Then he'd say, oh, it started in 1992 where some reports had, say his stealing started in the 1960s when he began working on Wall Street. He had one of the original uh, major Ponzi schemes, right? Wasn't yeah, that Yes. It? Yep, that's exactly right. A Ponzi scheme. And, you know, it takes other people going to get other people to invest. And he knew all along that there was nothing behind it. it it's a, Okay, so a Ponzi scheme, in case you're wondering, is a type of fraud that gets investors, uh, lures them in. And has the investors pay profits, but those profits, those investors are paying actually go to earlier investors. Uh, right. So with, like, you know, so you keep thinking, oh, look, my investors paying off. No, it's just they're getting more suckers to buy in and pay. You know, that's how it works. Yeah. But eventually the whole thing collapsed and yeah, you know, yeah, everybody yeah, exactly. who was involved with it. Yeah. And yes. it was named after a guy named Charles Ponzi who started this technique of defrauding people in the 1920s. That's why it's called a Ponzi scheme or Ponzi game. And, uh, you know, he's so he's saying, oh, I'm dying of kidney disease. Let me out of prison. You know, I was reading that he's refusing dialysis, which is one of the treatments when you have end stage renal disease, when you have renal disease. 
But, you know, what do you think? Should he be let out of jail early? I mean, he's like, oh, I'm going to, I'm dying. Let me out. Do you think, what do you think? Was I, he going to go out and get treatment? Too. I mean, I mean, no, well, he's like, he's let refu- me out because I'm going he's, to die. I mean, he's getting, he's offered treatment in jail, but he's, he's, he's not taking, it, yeah. he's offered, uh, what do you call the thing? Um, when you get the, 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 the oh gosh. Dialysis. Right? Dialysis, but he's refusing it. He's refusing it in jail. Well, this brings up an interesting question in, in the, the study of, and the virtue of justice, right? Mm, yeah. um, you know, there's, and I'm going to mess up some of my technical terminology here, but there, there's, there's the justice that you have when you're, you know, one-on-one and you can make a sympathetic appeal and, and you know, a person can say, well, you know, you, you've, you've touched my heart and so on and so forth. And, and yeah, sure, I'll, I'll let you off the hook or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also civic justice, or let's call it group justice, right? Mm-hmm. Where the group, that is to say all the citizens of a given jurisdiction, get together and empower their leaders with powers that they would not normally have, including mm-hmm. the power to jail someone, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the thing about group justice is it allows you to maintain societal order in the group, and that's why we why we do it. That's why, why it's useful. The challenge for group justice is that it demands discipline, and it demands sometimes that you don't listen to some of those pleas, you know, coming from, mm-hmm. because for, for the sake of the greater machinery of the state and the greater ordering of all society, you got to say, no, man, you, this is what it meant when the judge said, you're going to get this much time. You got to serve that much time. Um, uh, so it's, it's unfortunate. It, it pulls at the heart. It might even pull at the heartstrings, which would be understandable for individuals. But as a matter of societal order and justice, sometimes you got to let the, the time run out. You know, mm-hmm. it's just it's unfortunate, but it's the way it works. Well, when he got his sentence, I mean, it was clear in 2039. He knew he was going to be dead before he got out of prison anyway. Yeah. So why should mm-hmm. he get a reprieve? What, what, his victims didn't get a reprieve. So he's saying he wants to, He's asking a judge for a compassionate release from prison. Because he has terminal kidney failure and a life expectancy of less than 18 months, according to his filing. He's 81 years old. Um, you know, he's serving a sentence, like I said, in North Carolina. And when they made the sentence, though, I, I think, yeah, they were clear that we want you to spend the rest of your natural life in jail and not get out. And he's saying he wants this compassionate relief. Um, although he says, look, I don't I don't dispute the severity of my crimes, but I think I'm, I deserve a compassionate relief released and he submitted a request to the bureau of prisons you know for compassionate release and the warden was like no he's he's living right now in the prison's hospice facility but he's uh refusing the the treatment for the kidney failure and his request however was denied and the warden didn't dispute Madoff's condition or life expectancy, but he noted in the letter, look, you've refused dialysis. And he says Mr. Yeah, Madoff was accountable for a exactly. loss to investors of over $13 billion. And here's so accordingly, question. no, basically. Mm-hmm. Would we even be talking about this if he was an unknown person? No. If yeah, there hadn't been see, headlines that's, written yeah. about, you know, like in terms of equal justice under the law, does the um, – does the purse snatcher get the same kind of equal justice? Does the the, the drug dealer get equal justice? Does the, right. I don't know. Right. Um, and this guy's clearly a big time crook, a big time manipulator, a big time liar. He was living ridiculously large, knowing that it was all air, all vapor that he was mm-hmm. selling people. Um, he... He uh, apparently, he he likes to keep himself in the news. He apparently emailed CNBC in January 2014 saying he had a heart attack and was suffering from stage four kidney disease. To me, it seems like he's, he's expecting, he's expecting for some reason to get out. He even reached out to President Trump to ask for that the president would commute his sentence. Um, he's saying, look, I, I have extraordinary and compelling reasons for compassionate release. But, you know, maybe I'm just salty and thinking, dude, you really did some harm, you know? actual harm and and, you know he's saying look my son died by suicide in 2010 and that's my fault my other son died of cancer in 2014 i'm just having it rough let me out and my health let me die in peace at home so you know let us know what you think about that should he be let out should he stay in morning glory at ewtn.com what do we have coming up next the relationship between faith and our lenten practices
Let Morning Glory keep your heart and soul warm all winter. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. There was no single event. It was more gradual. You know, eventually you just don't go one Sunday and then you don't go two Sundays in a row. Then went through a divorce and um, ended up being a single parent. If I didn't have church or God, I, I, I would be back at that lonely stage, that trouble stage. Whenever you get anxious and worry about things, you just know that Jesus has it under control. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org. This is Mike and Alicia Hernan with the Messy Family Minute. When you have a fight with your spouse or, I mean, a discussion with emotion, uh, it's very easy to have tunnel vision and to make the goal of communication getting our way. Because, of course, we are right and they are wrong. The reality is there are many things couples need to decide that aren't moral issues, but instead prudential judgments. Often we can become obsessed with making the perfect decision, but we all need to remember that at the end of the day, even if you have a smarter idea than your spouse, it's better to be wrong together than right alone. The goal of communication in marriage is not about being right or even simply being understood but it's about achieving unity. We need to trust our spouse and listen with an open heart and being willing to see from a different perspective. Becoming a better listener with your spouse will actually make you a better person. For more insights, visit us at MessyFamilyMinute.org. Email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. Morning Glory, it's Catholic from coast to coast. Yes, you are listening to Morning Glory, and there's so many ways that you can connect with us on YouTube and Facebook and email and Twitter and uh, texting and the EWTN app. Don't forget about that. Well, we know that um, Lent is starting, and next week is Ash Wednesday, and and, and what's special this year is that uh, Father Donald Calloway is uh, wrote a wonderful book on consecration to St. Joseph, and so... You can join in that consecration every day in the morning after the rosary with Mother Angelica or at night after the EW10 rosary with Father Groeschel. Now through March 19th on EW10 Radio, join in that 33-day consecration to St. Joseph. Again, every day in the morning after the rosary with Mother or in the evening after the rosary with Father Benedict Groeschel. Now, through the 19th of March on EWTN Radio. And so, Father DeRosa, getting us ready yes. for next week uh, with yes, a connection in, between the virtues and, and faith. Uh, dive in. We are in training. Um, you know, the last couple of weeks here at my parish, because we observe both the ordinary form calendar and the extraordinary form calendar, uh, we've been thinking about these little Lent weeks. And last week, uh, I preached about... Uh, well, two weeks, two Sundays ago, I preached about uh, hope as a preparation for Lent. And then uh, this past Sunday, I preached about faith. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, faith is the origin, Cardinal Newman says, of all religion. And hope uh, and, and love is the origin of all holiness. Mm. And uh, Newman says, and, and this is interesting because people try to pull these two things apart, you know, love and faith, holiness and religion. People try to pull apart in the uh, I'm spiritual, but not not religious, religious. thing that people oh, say yeah. nowadays, you know. Yeah. Um, and he says, no, there's, they're part of the same person. They're, they're, they're distinguishable. You can, you can tell them apart from each other if you need to, but they're organically merged in, in, in the individual Christian soul that's trying to live it all out, right? To have... Uh, religion without holiness would be ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. um, one way that uh, Newman puts it is that love is the sacrifice and faith is the sacrificer, right? The mm -hmm. person carrying out the holy sacrifice and the means by which that happens. Um, and this all links beautifully with the idea that um, from the catechism that faith is our response to the presence of God's love in our lives, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's our it's our response to the presence of God's love in our lives, um, and we live this out through stuff. So somebody who has many responses to God's love is somebody that we say is a really faithful person, 
you know. So if you see somebody responding to his love by, you know, offering up lots of rosaries or uh, fasting or uh, doing great work serving those who are in need and so on, we say, wow, that person looks like they have a great faith. Um, and during Lent, we always want to sort of hone those uh, faith acts or those faith responses, right? So we take on extra uh, disciplines, we take on extra duties, uh, things that we, you know, would do to, so that in the rest of the year, when we kind of come down from Lent, our, we've raised the overall level of faith in our lives, right, during this intense time. Mm -hmm. So what I propose to folks during this little Lenten period, these uh, Septuagesima, Sexagesima, and Quinquagesima Sundays uh, leading up to Ash Wednesday is this. Examine your acts of faith and see if they are truly, truly connected with love. If they are, if they are truly responses to God's love, then those are the ones you want to ramp up. But every now and then, stuff happens. You know, we get distracted. We have other motivations that sneak in, sometimes pride. Sometimes um, maybe a little of anxiety, right? Uh, maybe a little Pelagianism here and there. And uh, we find ourselves sort of being beaten toward acts of faith rather than being attracted to them by God's love, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to, during these weeks, just examine that connection between faith and love and make sure that it's good and solid uh, before we uh, take on more actions during the holy season that starts next Wednesday. What do you guys think? I think actually the act of doing that um, uh, in, interior inspection, right, to see, to examine your acts of faith, are they really responses to God's love? You know, why are you doing these things? Because I think it can be, you know, dangerous if we just have public devotions just because it's public devotion. You have mm -hmm. to really examine your motivation for doing something. And uh, see what they spring from. Is it that you just want to fit in with the ladies at the Sodality? Is it that you just want to be with the dudes of the Holy Name Society or the Knights of Columbus are cool? You know, it mm -hmm. needs to, you're right. It, it can't just be just to do something to get along with everybody else. It needs to really spring from a response to God's love. And so I'm glad you asked that because that is something to really think about. And also I'm going to have to have you explain uh, Pelagianism like quickly because <laughs> you use that word the, the 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 nickel version of the word of of the definition is this um when we think that our actions by their own merits uh bring us salvation and therefore we just keep on heaping up more action on upon, upon more actions upon more actions thinking that that'll be a faster way to salvation mm -hmm. yep we love to hear what our morning glory listeners think text letters ewtn to five five zero 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 Wait for a response. It takes your first name and how you're listening and your comment and message and data rates may apply. I think it's a wonderful um, uh, recommendations there, Father, especially when you connect it to um, you know, when we think about Lent, we think of uh, prayer, fasting and almsgiving yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. connecting that idea of faith flowing out of the heart of God's love, connecting it to those um, to, 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 to what we typically um, uh, think about during this the time of Lent coming up, and so I think it's a wonderful way, a wonderful way to think about entering into Lent and being really prepared to really um, break ourselves open this Lent and really receive faith in a way um, in 2020 that maybe we haven't done in the past. So I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Newman uses some beautiful priestly language when he says, um, "How does it go?" He says. In, in these religious practices that we have, the sacrifice and the sacrificer are one. Mm. Just as Jesus was both the altar of sacrifice and the stuff of the sacrifice itself, right? So when, when, when God's people are offering up their actions, offering up their sacrifices to the Lord, we want to make sure that there's that total integrity, that total union mm. in the self of... Uh, of what's going on there. But let's go to some emails and texts and hear what our Morning Glory listeners have to say. Okay. Well, we got me. No, well, not me, but Harold on YouTube. <laughs> there we guy. He says, hey, hey, talking about uh, does it matter if Jesus is male or female? He said, of course it matters. If Adam was supposed to protect Eve from falling into temptation, then Jesus redeems us as the new Adam so as to restore us into eternal life with God if we choose him. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go to the next one because I'm having trouble pulling the things up on my... Well, Mary, listening to Morning Glory on Alexa, she texts us and she says the first 
that came to me was Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. She loves Morning Glory, and she says, P.S., I did take the Morning Glory survey. Oh, thank you so much, Mary. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we have her, right from, he, we're her from Tyler via text. He said, doesn't the Bible talk about Jesus being circumcised? Enough for me to be convinced. <laughs> He's like, yeah, <laughs> right, right. And Anna Maria listening on the Domestic Church Media in Jersey, yeah, my home state, emailed, I'm inspired by St. Teresa of Avila who said, until we come to know the love of Jesus as a man, we will never enter into the kingdom of God. Thank you for keeping us informed on what's coming on the horizon. Mm. You want to take this one, Father? Kathleen, listening on YouTube, texts us, and she says, uh, with regard to the Madoff story, what good really does it do to keep Bernie Madoff in prison on the taxpayer's dollar? There has to be a better solution uh, for white-collar crimes like restitution. It's a, yeah. it's a legitimate argument. He didn't have enough money to pay back those billions, though. That's the thing. Not everybody's <laughs> getting his money. He stole so much. He didn't have enough to give it back. Uh, he And so he's destroyed a lot of lives and families. Actually, yeah. I know a family that was affected by the Madoff. Uh, they yeah. all had to go back to work. It's terrible. Yeah. Lori Ann listening on, mm-hmm. yeah, Lori Ann listening on 93.1 in Pittsburgh, Kansas, email. I'm just appalled as you think about this gender dysphoria. If I had a child who wanted to identify as a cat, we call it a mental health problem. <laughs> That's true. She's right. Well, and she took the Morning Glory the, survey as well, so thank you for that. The Lord's been so good to us this morning, and we give him thanks for the gift of life, and most especially of life in Christ. You know, folks, go out there, grab that life, celebrate it with all that you have today uh, as a response to God's love. And may the Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. The Catholic Church sees the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life, to which the other sacraments